Are we all uh, good to go? Is everyone settled down? Looking at, uh, prepared to tweet and engage socially in this fascinating conversation? Tweet, so much tweeting. Or eating during this conversation. Both are accepted. Uh, looks like we are beginning this session. Uh, we should uh, get it going because there's a lot to talk about. And uh, I, for one, find the session to be particularly fascinating. And I'm very much looking forward to speaking to these two experts in their respective fields. And I'm actually honored to be up here with them. Uh, this is uh, the panel for marketing and advertising in a world of bombardment. And uh, it's indeed uh, quite true because it is very difficult to get attention uh, through the multiple platforms that we have. It's particularly difficult uh, when you are trying to sell something as well to be able to do that. And I think that there's a lot of important strategies and lessons to be learned as we try to figure this game out. And it'll be interesting to hear a few perspectives. But basically, even though I'll be asking a few questions, uh, this is meant to be a larger conversation. And by the end of it, we hope to open up the floor to you guys to really feel free to ask whatever questions uh, you think would be most useful to our experts. So allow me to uh, introduce them. I'm going to start with uh, Carolina Joan. Uh, Carolina is an accomplished digital media executive who spent the last decade in cross-functional leadership roles encompassing sales, marketing, and ad operations. She is currently the director of business development for Cadreon, which is IPG Media Brand's ad tech unit, responsible for fostering strategic partnerships leveraging best-in-class programmatic solutions, increasing ROI for Fortune 500 advertisers, such as, you might have heard of them, Johnson & Johnson, Chrysler, Sony, and Lebet. She is also the current co-chair for IAB Canada's Data and Analytics Committee, committed to advocating best practices and identifying key challenges and growth opportunities that will help drive the digital advertising industry forward. Prior to Cadreon, Carolina was the digital strategist and social media manager at Samsung Canada and a key member of the executive sales team that helped to launch the new MSN portal in Canada. So clearly, Carolina comes to us with a whole swath of expertise. You make me sound amazing. It's like I wrote it. <laughs> Bio is an incredible thing. On that note, I'll move over to Corin Whitney Vernon's bio. Uh, so Corin serves as CEO of Shift2. Uh, that was actually represented this morning uh, somewhat by uh, Jay Bennett uh, in, in the English language case study, uh, that and the smoke bomb. Uh, an innovative agency that helps brands explore their millennial voice using scripted series and social media to drive measurable results. A co-venture with leading production company Shaftesbury and its digital arm Smoke Bomb Entertainment, Shift2 works with brands to harness the power of video content on YouTube. Branded entertainment projects include the hit you by Kotex funded series Carmilla with, I'm not getting this wrong, 45 million views and counting, which is amazing, on the company's Kinda TV channel, which is now the largest scripted YouTube channel for millennials in Canada. Also amazing. And V Morgan is Dead, a scripted mystery series brought to life by RBC. Additional branded content includes fashion focused comedy series Mislabeled, produced in partnership with Shaw Media and Shit Quattro for Women, season one and Tetley for season two, and lifestyle series I Do, funded by Cotton Incorporated. With 15 years experience as CEO of Youth Culture, one of Canada's largest youth media companies, Karen has a proven track record creating successful millennial targeted products, including popular lifestyle brand Verve Girl and TrendScan, the premier research study providing data on marketing to youth in Canada for more than 35 national and international brands. Karin also served as executive producer of The Avenue, the first reality show on YouTube, which garnered over 2.5 million views and developed countless loyal fans. So, we got some experts here, and they're coming at it from two different perspectives, and what I think is gonna be very interesting, I've spoken to them a little bit before, is seeing where the convergence is between what they have to say, and also where there might be a difference of opinion as well, I think will be very interesting. Uh, we had a clip actually for Corin. Maybe we could potentially play this to uh, lead into our first question. Uh, it is a Dropbox clip. Shift to.
and that's <laughs> the court. Um, so actually, before we begin, actually, this is something I want to do off the top, but maybe we can figure out, just to get a sense of who's in the audience right now, because I know there's a, a wide range of people. How many people here would describe themselves as producers or content creators? Okay, not a, a whole lot of you, but represent. Uh, how many people here would say they're from the broadcasting community? How many people here are with brands or in the advertising community, perhaps? Yeah, all four of you. Amazing. <laughs> okay. Any other uh, groups that I'm missing out on? Academics. Academics? I like the sound of that. <laughs> Public policy. I also like the sound of that. There's a lot of actually legal and policy issues related to branded content. Anyone else? Uh, okay. Uh, well, that's a very, very interesting crowd. So let's, because uh, we should start off, it's obviously you guys have a lot of sophistication in your areas, but just to make sure we're on the same playing field, we should probably start off by just defining some of the lingo that we'll probably be talking about. So how would you describe words like advertisement, branded content, and sponsored content? What do you think differenti differentiates them, if anything at all? Uh, and you know, how do things like, we hear terms like content integrations, branded integrations, product placement, are these all the same buzzwords that relate to the same thing, or do you see some major differences between all these? Well, I do, for sure. And um, recently, I think in the last two years at the Cannes International Creative um, Festival, there were over 1,300 entries into that award, and they never gave up the gold. And they just, because it's for branded entertainment and branded content, and we're still doing what we've done always, which was, Branded content is we put the brand first. It's usually you're running a campaign, and we've got a new launch, a new product, we're gonna put the uh, piece of branded content around it. Branded entertainment should be about the, the audience first, and that's really hard for brands to get their, wrap their head around. So I would definitely make a distinction between, you know, obviously advertisement is there to push the product, it's a push kind of scenario, uh, but branded entertainment, its role is to first entertain um, an audience, um, not to push the product. So that's the distinction. So I guess Carmilla would fall under branded entertainment mm -hmm. in, in your view. Yeah. And, and things like product placement, where would you define something like that? I mean, that's existed for a long time in Hollywood and filmmaking. Oh yeah, I mean, we all can remember, I think everyone can remember the um, E.T. back in the 80s. I mean, they made, they made uh, uh, Reese's Peanut, uh, the little, that's very famous, right? Because of the, the placement of ET. Um, and I know that that's sort of what we, we strive for with branded entertainment um, or branded uh, content. So it is putting that product first into, into a scenario that people kind of make it, they see, think it's natural, but we all know that when we see a, a Coke bottle and it's got 75% of the logo showing, that that is paid for. And I think um, because we talk to millennials all the time, they sniff this out right away. They know when something is placed in a certain way that that is, um, it's a brand that's paying for that opportunity. Right, they are good at that. Uh, Carolina, on your side, you deal, you specialize in the world of programmatic ad buying. So I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar with that term. So maybe you can explain a little bit what programmatic ad buying is and how this this has been changing the advertising landscape for a while. Yeah, absolutely. So I play in the field of paid media, paid advertising. Um, programmatic is just a jargony, fancy way to say digital media infused with uh, technology so we can make the buying process more automated. So I think the best way to um, describe programmatic is by taking away, taking it back to the traditional way of buying uh, digital media where you would call up your rep, negotiate the rates, uh, website by website, portal by portal, uh, and pre-buy inventory in bulk in hopes to reach the audience you want. So for example, if I want to do a buy on Chatelaine.com in hopes to reach women 25 to 54, I would do that, negotiate, have a contract. Uh, with programmatic, we directly plug into the inventory <coughs> source, and it's a shift from buying inventory to buying audiences you want at scale. So instead of hoping to reach women 25 to 54, we pay for women 25 to 54, impression by impression, in real time, and we can layer in data. So not only do I want this one impression, this person I'm reaching to be a woman that's 25 to 54, uh, but I also want her to be in market for a car. And I think it's the marriage between uh, data and audience. And because there's so much data, big data, it just means more data, 
um, that we have the, the luxury to carve out these niche audiences at scale. And generally, as you drill down and get more specific about an yeah. audience member, I assume it becomes more expensive for an advertiser. Yes and no, depending on, yeah, depending on, so it's all option based, right? So now everyone is kind of, it's kind of like a, like the stock market. So you have all these large publishers who now kind of plug into the same pool, this open exchange of inventory, all this unsold inventory. Um, and, and if I'm looking for a woman that's 25 to 54 and I'm competing, you get to set the bar like I'm only, I only want to pay up to $5 for her. Um, and this, the, I guess the pool is so broad now that it kind of ebbs and flows. So not necessarily more expensive, but for certain data sets. So uh, there's offline and online data that you can purchase. So Air Miles, for example, will sell their data. So if I want to see, you know, what to purchase this person uh, based on their past purchases or their past behavior, then yes, you'd have to incur uh, a greater cost. My stuff is so boring, but I, I, <laughs> well, I, I believe you. So. It's a future guest. I mean, I think I think it's quite. I'm sure for people that were buying media 30 or 40 years ago, the idea that it could be that targeted and then retargeting. Oh, absolutely. Is is pretty fascinating. Oh, that's a whole other conversation. Retargeting. Uh, well, maybe <laughs> we'll have time for it. We'll see. Uh, I see we can. All right, amazing, yes. <laughs> um, but let's actually go back a little bit into a prior media time where there was more focus on traditional advertising. So Karn, it, it, advertising is basically not in its heyday like it once was for the viewer, because now PBR lets consumers fast forward through traditional advertising. Uh, many streaming services, as far as don't have advertising at all. With changes to the way consumers are getting their content, how do you say the role of sponsored content has changed in the last five years or so. Well, does anybody have teenagers or young adults in their family? Like, when was the last time you saw them sitting in front of the television? Um, I, don't know. I, I never want to see my kids anymore in front of the television, and it probably happened four or five years ago, where we had a family room and there was no one in it. And I realized everyone had gone into their own little space and was watching exactly what they wanted, when they wanted. And to be honest, I mean, I was, I was in the print world, and I looked around at YouTube, and I saw what was happening there, and I sold my company. I just went, this, this is, no one's here anymore. Uh, if the kids aren't reading, they're not watching the ads. They're certainly not waiting for an ad to come out. Uh, they're not tweeting it. They're not talking about it in most cases. Um, and then we've all heard of ad blocking. I mean, that's the other thing that gets me is, you know, I'm sitting watching something on YouTube, and my son looked at me and said, why are you watching the ad? I said, well, in five seconds, I can just skip it. It's fine. He goes, no, 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 you don't even have to have the ad come up. It's that realization that, you know, being in the advertising world for so long, because we always look at the ads. That's part of my business. But what I saw was all these young people aren't looking at the ads, and they don't care about them. And how, as marketers, are we going to get to them and, and give them something? Um, and the, the option is on mobile now for them to be able to just click it at a moment's notice and go, I'm bored. I don't like this. Um, we have to give them something that's going to engage them, that's going to have them coming back for more. And I'm, I'm personally so tired of the viral video, I mean the one-off video. Again, it's, you know, it's, it had a moment, but you, you have this little moment of conversation around it and then it's gone. So our whole idea around entertainment is it has to be ongoing. It's not a campaign, it's there to create an audience, it's there to create like an opportunity for a fan base to grow around it, and that takes Nothing happens overnight, as we all know. Um, and so it is that opportunity to come back and have a reason for you to come back and, and watch that. And that's really where I think advertisers have to get to, is stop thinking about themselves and think about the audience that they're trying to go after. But I'm kind of wondering, just to skip ahead, how do you ultimately demonstrate when you build that audience for years? I guess ultimately someone's saying, okay, well, when are the sales of the product coming in? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious, in your experience, how cool are the brands about understanding that, uh, this is my bias, but it's, it's not a clear thing that's necessarily all that trackable. Uh, you have to have faith in the process. I'm, I'm kind of curious what the range is as far as the brands that you deal with in terms of saying, mm -hmm. we need this particular ROI, or it's a general, no, we understand you're building a community, you're, a lot, lots of stuff is happening on social media for us, that is very satisfying. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest. I mean, brands have to have an ROI. They're not looking at this. I always say this can't be a vanity metric. We have to prove that we can sell more tampons, get the change of perspective, you know, perception of a of a bank. Um, so we do. Uh, we start off in doing research, like finding out what what do people think about this particular brand? How do they engage with it? 
uh, where they get some information about this industry. And from there, um, we can show after a series that we've actually moved the dial on those key triggers. Um, you know, how do we prove sales? I mean, I always throw it back to advertisers. Well, how do you prove on a television campaign? Um, well, we can't really because we were doing radio at the same time and outdoor and we're not really sure. So, you know, there, there's a lot of guesswork in this, but we're hoping with a lot of the data that we have and, and help from, we always do a paid campaign around it. Yeah, that we, yeah, no, <laughs> you have to. You can't, nobody's going to find your great content unless you, unless you have a campaign behind it. So it is looking at the data that we can get in these areas, but at the end of the day, that fan base um, will appreciate you giving them good talk content. They appreciate you not banging them over the head with an ad. Um, and they will listen to you. They, they give you that respect. They, they, they really do. It's amazing. I think on the, the note of, of data, it's true. I think now that everything becomes so trackable online, that everyone's measuring all the analytics and, and seeing how all the pieces tie together, all the different channels across all the different platforms, that when Karin or, or whoever does a huge branded initiative to kind of increase brand affinity, you can see where on the funnel, where on that conversion path uh, it, it impacts. And I think with that data, you can drive closer to ROI, and then you have more performance metrics, such as retargeting or, or um, other messaging, maybe native ads with a stronger call to action that may be a little further away from the branding perspective, but uh, drives closer to the end point of sale. Well, I think if it's e-commerce oriented, like I don't know how many people are buying tampons online, I, I truly really have no <laughs> idea about this world. Uh, but, but maybe people are. Maybe yes, this is being done in bulk by Amazon and drones are, are dropping them off at this point. But if that's the case, and I imagine Funny that it's kind of track. <laughs> no, I don't mind. Uh, but, and I, you know, but for things that require you know walking up and doing something, doing something in a retail space, that's probably a lot harder to track. Although I wouldn't be surprised if people were already working on that. There's anymore. beacons now. It's, yeah. it's becoming a very interesting space. But I feel brands like tampons that relies on uh, the, the strength of their brand, uh, then reinforcing that brand affinity is incredibly important. But you know, you have a two oranges. Which one would you prefer? So. Absolutely. I think about the retail experience. I mean, we all walk down the aisles, and there's a thousand choices of whatever the product is. Say and tell us. Yeah, and there is. The consumer is kind of shut down after a while, and, and so by having that connection, that emotional connection that we've created, um, where we actually encode um, the the brand archetype and the brand um, uh, values within the story world, that stands out when they are walking down that aisle and kind of go, oh, which tampon should I have? Um, there is that connection, um, but we, we go even further, and I, mean, I don't know how many people saw Jay's presentation, but we're now actually had fans that created the boxes of, you buy Kotex tampons, and now you see the characters coming to life on the boxes, and so it is that tying and full kind of circle of the story world into the, the product. Um, yeah, which I thought was extremely cool, extremely cool that they get that excited about it, and they're really, I think what he's saying was you didn't reveal that the brand was involved until was it episode 17 or episode mm -hmm. 16. And yet nonetheless, once it was there, because you had established that trust, they're excited about the brand. They're not just excited about the show, they're actually behind the brand. So I think it's interesting. At some point you guys are going to see a clip and it's all going to make sense. Yeah. <laughs> like, what are they talking about? Uh, we could show it now. Uh, yeah, let's do it now so there's some context. Uh, the Many industries are facing major disruptions at the hands of millennials. Banking is no exception, with research suggesting young people would rather have a root canal than speak to their bank. Understanding this, RBC wanted to change the way they speak to young Canadians, and were willing to think of new ways to engage this audience. Enter Shift 2 and Smoke Bomb Entertainment, who believe in starting a two-way conversation with millennials through scripted series using characters and storylines that they can relate to. Give the audience something of value, and they will be open to listening to your message. To achieve this, we created V. Morgan is Dead, a 20-part scripted series starring V. Morgan, who after dying suddenly, wakes up on the mysterious sixth floor. There, she's given an opportunity by her boss, Benson, help others on Earth get back on their destined life paths, and she'll get her life back. Using the theme of helping people navigate key life moments as a starting point, the RBC values were weaved into the series in an authentic and non-obtrusive way. In doing so, RBC established itself as an entertainment provider and content creator, the first step in making youth aware that they really are valued customers. New episodes were released weekly on YouTube, and V. Morgan is Dead was brought to life on multiple social media channels. Conversations surrounding the series extended onto the V. Morgan is Dead and RBC co-branded website, vmorganisdead.com, where fans of the series could find exclusive behind-the-scenes content, interviews, blog posts, quizzes, and more. 
Throughout the series, RBC and Shift2 used various research approaches to better understand millennials and the relationship with banking, the series content, its characters, and the RBC brand. The initial research was used as a benchmark on brand perception. The secondary research culminated in a series entitled Conversations Brought to Life by RBC. This companion digital series showcased the audience's favorite characters discussing life and the issues they face in a light and entertaining way. The end result was a branded two-way conversation to demonstrate that RBC understands someone like me. The conversation and engagement hit a fever pitch when we engaged YouTuber Lily Singh, aka Superwoman, to give a shout out to the series on her daily vlog and Snapchat. The Me Morgan Is Dead series boasts over 1 million views and 1.9 million impressions on social media, with daily fan engagement in the form of fan art, GIFs, recaps, and more. Postwave research found that consumer connection to RBC and usage intent for the brand rose significantly among those exposed to Me Morgan Is Dead. V. Morgan may be dead, but the power of branded storytelling is very much alive. Very cool. So let me ask, this is the first thing that comes to mind, which is, what's the creative process for coming up with something to go to RBC? I'm just picturing a pitch meeting where just the idea of going to an RBC office and saying it's about someone dying <laughs> sounds like totally acrimonious, like it wouldn't work. So I'm just curious. I'm curious about the process and how you're really taking <coughs> very traditional brands and putting them in some pretty untraditional circumstances. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the bank is a perfect example. I mean, they're what I call the ruler brand. They've obviously had a big history. Um, and the first thing out was uh, millennials don't like ruler brands. And they're, they're looking for someone to disrupt this, this category. Um, everyone knows about FinTech and what's coming out. But the banks are actually really, uh, you know, scared about what's happening next and so I think they are willing to take a little bit of a risk. Um, I mean it was, we had our little group, uh, we couldn't go up right out and say it to everybody because uh, there's so many different layers at RBC but we did a, we did research first. It was always little bits of comfort first to find out what was their core demographic that we're going after for millennials and where could we get the most traction uh, and then we came up with a selection of stories and they went for the one that was right off the deep end. Like we gave them ones that we thought were like really cautious, but we didn't want to do, and they just said, let's go for it. So um, I think I think brands are starting to, you know, if you can get the biggest company in Canada to do this, I mean, I think they have a market cap of $81 billion. They have, uh, what did they say, 20, you know, over 8 million employees. I mean, it's just, or 8 million customers. I mean, it's just a massive organization, and they're willing to do it because they know that change is happening. And if they're gonna sit on the sideline, somebody else is gonna come along like the bank of Google, and we just saw a bank of, you know, Apple coming up with something today that it's got, you know, a Apple Pay. And if they're not getting on board, do you think a millennial is gonna walk into a bank and start doing its banking? There's no way, so. Well, uh, I applaud their uh, innovative thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and to be quite honest, I'm a bit surprised by it. I'm yeah. positively surprised by it. They want to go in that direction. Um, Carolina, this, on, on your end of things, uh, we're talking about the struggles producers have getting um, products discovered, which is a large part of why we're here. So, with the rise of streaming, can you talk a bit about the struggles that advertisers are facing getting their products discovered? What strategies are you now implementing to get product names out there to the public? Yeah, for sure. Um, to be honest, I don't think there is a problem. I think there's we've never uh, had a time where there's so many different channels and so much different devices that you can consume content on and all these different platforms that just because you can't push uh, advertising content through like linear TV, for example, or certain streaming services, it still opens up all these other channels like social media where people are consuming content. Um, mobile devices, uh, different sites on mobile, gaming, in-app, where a lot of people spend most of their free time. In fact, I think the stat is 80% um, of the time spent on a, on a mobile device is on an app in one of like 10 apps. And I bet five of those apps are some weird game like Candy Crush or some Marvel game, but whatever your flavor is. Um, so it becomes a really interesting space and it's just about adopting to which platform uh, makes the most sense for your message and the type of content you're trying to push out. Uh, and direct it at the type of user you want and the mindset when they're consuming that, that content. So for example, if I want to push a piece out on LinkedIn, um, and there's a lot of different rich, I guess, executions you can do uh, with LinkedIn, that it's more of a professional mindset. Um, if you want to hit someone in the evening when they're more relaxed, and you want to hit them on a tablet device, 
uh, maybe on a social media platform. It just becomes a really interesting space. So I think the opportunity is endless, and it's just about being creative and knowing who your target is and knowing uh, and understanding if your message aligns with, with the, the strategy. And when you're doing these sort of campaigns, I guess yeah. it's people like yourself who are thinking this out as human beings, thinking of the strategy, and then you're putting various inputs into some sort of bidding system, and then that's just being followed through automatically and independently, or well, what's you, the process like? Right, right. You actually um, buy media when you think of it as well. Yes, so you'd be amazed how unautomated the automated process of digital media buying and planning is. And when I say programmatic, we play in every channel uh, that's digital. So um, out of home, digital out of home can be done programmatically now um, with the use of data. Um, so that's like restrooms and, and uh, transit ads, tr uh, hotel elevators, things like that, uh, as well as traditional desktop and mobile devices, social media, different video distribution channels. Um, and ironically, uh, advanced TV is coming along. So uh, the ability to buy linear TV in a more programmatic way. Um, that being said, I feel Canada, there's still a lot of things to work out in order for that to happen. But in the interim, you can still buy television uh, ads via video through connected devices like set-top boxes, gaming consoles. So when I'm on my, or a smart TV, <coughs> that when I'm on my smart TV and I want to watch Crackle, for example, before the uh, my content plays, there'll be a pre-roll video, and the option to make that video more interactive. So the ability to play with the ad, click on things, uh, make it a lot more immersive, if you will. Um, but in terms of the process, it's, it really comes down to what is your core objective? Is it branding? Is it awareness? Uh, is it sales? And depending on what your, your goal is, what are the key KPIs, I still sound so boring, the key metrics that will help indicate success. So if it's sales, for example, then it'll be your conversion rate, your cost per acquisition, or your cost per action if it's a lead. Um, if it's awareness, could it be um, the average cost per thousand? So how cheaply are you getting these eyeballs? Um, or it could be click-through rate or engagement rate or things like that. So once we figure out what the objective is and does that align to the marketing goals, um, then we select the platforms we want, and every platform has different targeting options and different ad formats. And then we select the, I guess, the right combination, and then we push it out. So, for example, if you're running um, an acquisition campaign and your goal is to increase sales of a product, sometimes literally a boring banner is the best way to go. And it's not sexy, but it does the job. So, and we target it. So, more on that later. <laughs> So uh, I'm actually just kind of curious, like yeah. right now you're saying out of home is a possibility. Yeah. If so I were bidding on something right now, I don't know if there are the Thompson Hotel uh, ad, ad units in the elevator, but are you telling me that I could literally click and it could show up on like an elevator in Vancouver? Is it really, um, has the business gone to this point? Yeah, yes and yes and no. So we're actually in the, the process of doing a press release. Um, so IPG, we will be launching the first campaign in Canada to be bought programmatically through digital out of home. Um, it's a partnership with New Ad. Initially, it was a partnership with New Ad and Patterson. So even though we're very automated and, and the way to book the inventory um, is very automated, the process of getting the ad up is still not very automated. And there's no standardization across the different vendors. So it's still a little manual. Um, so programmatic digital out of home is near real time in that um, they can do it a lot quicker than they used to be able to do it, um, that in terms of cost efficiencies and in terms of placement. So I can select, I want this particular hotel or this particular restaurant at Yorkville, I only want to show my ad between 11 to 2 p.m. in the females in the women's bathroom. So in that sense, it's, it's a lot more um, interesting, but there's still all those hurdles that uh, comes with parts of the process being manual. Look out for that press release, guys. <laughs> I'm very proud. I certainly will. <laughs> and I happen to find this cool, by the way. Oh, okay, cool, awesome, yeah. Damn it. Um, you know what? I'm gonna find out where you live, buy the bathroom spot, and just run it. That's not cool. <laughs> Caroline, did you get to see the the actual creative? Like, or is yes. that is, is are they pulling that closer together, or is it still really siloed? Um, it, it depends. So for me, because I'm a director of business development, I uh, my whole job is to create new relationships, new partnerships, pitch for new pieces of business. So this is with uh, a new advertiser. And the interesting thing is when you win a new advertiser, they just got out of a messy divorce with their last agency. That they're like, no, no, come love me, trust me, let's do this thing, let's. Um, so it, it becomes very intimate, and then so we can, I can help guide them along the, the trade process. But unfortunately, because of lead times and the cost of making creative, sometimes you have to kind of go cheap and dirty. So for digital auto home, for example, we're running the same pre-roll ad that we will across device. So this execution is actually cross-channel. 
Um, it's an on-game channel uh, execution. We're doing radio. We can even do audio programmatically now. The same Spotify, just Google Play. Um, mobile, desktop, social media across Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and digital and home. So it's going to be an interesting execution, but because there's so many moving parts, we have to use the same pre-roll creative. They just didn't have the money. To bring the worlds together, we could presumably use programmatic for brand and entertainment, correct? <laughs> to push it, to push it out, yes. Um, in order of creating it, I feel my world ends where her world starts, right? Because I'm very automated, and the, the thing with automation is it has to be standardized. Whereas hers, it's, it's very creative and, and custom um, that you have to tailor it to the different platforms. But in terms of pushing it out to different uh, to different channels based on your the format, or like if it's video, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, and the channels you want to drive to, then yes, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Karen, let's talk about sponsorship deals. Uh, as we all know that many of them are not created equal. Uh, what examples can you give of a time when sponsored content worked particularly well? Maybe you can tell us why you thought it worked. And on the flip side, can you tell us of examples of less successful sponsored content? Well, I mean, there's, um an area that YouTube has done a really great job on. They, they divide content into three kind of buckets, and one they call the hero content. And the hero content is that thing that's just gonna blast everybody out and get the attention. Um, think of Volvo and Van Damme, the Volvo truck. I don't know if anybody saw that, where he did the, the splits on that moving truck. And um, people then want to start to watch well, what was behind the scenes on that, and how did he do that? And, and that's the hero content. That's getting that massive eyeball to it. Um, so I think that's a great, you know, way of showing that that sponsor, like that that content that's being paid for and using, um, and making sure that they have the buckets to support it. So that's a good campaign. They did uh, other videos where then they showed what the inside of the truck looked like, um, and they took you that more immersive into it. Um, you know, I, I don't want to slam anything bad. I mean, there there's again, there's one that I saw because I play in the the teen millennial space, so um, there's um, anybody from the uh, clear soul world, I don't know, but uh, they did a um, ultra clear soul zombie series, and um, within the first two seconds of the opening line of this series, I thought, oh, this is gonna be great, I love zombies, I'm, I'm totally into zombies, and so I started watching it, and this girl gets on the, the uh, she skypes with this guy, and she, he's got a big zit on his face, and. She goes, oh my God, what's wrong with your face? And she said, oh, I got a zit. And I'm already like, oh no, oh no, it's, I just see it coming. And the apocalypse is happening, right? Like, and they're talking about the zit on his face and he goes, oh, don't worry. And he holds up the, I just used the ultra clarisol. And I, you can see, bam, people are gone. Like it just, and I thought they, they then had six other episodes afterwards, but no one is watching it because everyone's left. Because it, it, it just kind of, it ruined the moment. So, um, and it is a really cute show. Like afterwards, I watched the whole thing, but that's my business. But I, I was just like, God, they missed that opportunity to, to do it right front and center. They ruined it. But you were talking before about some millennial, well, in our prior conversation, about some research about millennials and their reactions to logos mm -hmm. in specific, which I thought was very interesting. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. that study. Uh, I, I think basically that they're turned off by the logos. I think was the well, I mean, you should have thought on the, um, the wonderful thing about working with RBC is they had, they had deep pockets and they want to test everything. And at the end of the day, that's what we have to do. We have to try it. There's nothing really wrong with anything. You try it and you test it um, and hopefully learn from it. So this was a company called Brain Sites. Um, and I, I did the test of about 250 people within the top target group. And all I have to do now is sit and watch uh, content with these special brain things on that test different wave brain waves um, and they look to see where you were losing people and then where you've actually encoded so where there's an emotional connection with the content and so it's fascinating because when I look at YouTube I can see where people are you know on the back end you can see where people watch and where they fall off second by second and what happened was we tested four different spots to say what happens if we put the logo here what happens if we have a voiceover with a logo? And what happens if we just have the logo? And what happens if we put it, whether we had one with a mug with the, the logo on it and the voiceover? And if you ruin it, if you don't get it right, we watched as the audience would go, okay, bam, we'd see them drop off. And then they wouldn't watch any, like th their whole emotions moving forward, their, their tension was gone. 
And so that made us all go, we saw it on YouTube, we could see the drop off, but we didn't know why. And then we realized it's the logo. Like the logo instantly made people go, what, this is a bank? I don't wanna watch this anymore. Um, so it is, there are ways to do it. Uh, we found when you did the voiceover with the logo, it was less intrusive um, than just having the logo because now I actually like that character and so she's telling me, so they, 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 they respected that a lot more and they would watch through the rest. So that's what we ended up doing. Um, but ideally, you, you, wanna, you wanna find that you have to let the audience get into it before you slap them with the logo because that'll just turn them off. Right. And it sounds like millennials have some serious skepticism about brands in oh, general. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest problem we, we all face is trust. I mean, millennials don't trust politicians, they don't trust banks, they don't trust big business. That's why they are looking for the startups and the, you know, the, uh, the smaller uh, kind of renegade brands. Um, so I think these, one of the reasons why I love working with legacy brands is because they do have this challenge with millennials, but there's such an opportunity, but they just have to flip their thinking around. I'm just going to um, add to that point, and I think it's an incredibly valid point. I also think the placement and, and the timeliness of the logo really depends on the vehicle you're using. So, for example, uh, we work really closely with Google at my company, um, and if you only have 30 seconds to get your point across, Google actually tells you, put the ad within the first five seconds and engagement will increase, and they have studies around that. But it's because it's an ad and not an episode, right? Whereas you're trying to build an affinity, uh, we're just trying to get a message across, and I think depending on the, the tactic, then the logo delivery can, can work in different ways. Because how Google worded it to us was that if they can skip it in five seconds, make it worth your month, make it worth your while, and show your your logo in the first five seconds. So well, also you because it's skippable, you can Absolutely. guarantee that it's going to play yes. in five seconds. And it's not an ongoing series, right? I, I do agree that if that's the case, you will lose the credibility, and then because you're in it for the long haul, we're in it for like a short and dirty, wham bam. Thank you, man. That's, I said that I went there. All right. And you <laughs> Just curious, uh, Caroline, programmatic yes. buying is by nature automated. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this format work when it comes to trying to reach niche audiences? Uh, we were talking about getting granular. I'm just curious, how granular can you go? What's like the deepest you could possibly go? It's like a limbo from? stick. How low can you go? Um, pretty low, actually. So because of, of big data, which just means that there's more data being collected, more data being stored, um, and more, which allows for more data to be granularly segmented. So for example, if I go back like 10 years ago, if I wanted to do category targeting, it would be like business, and that's kind of it, just very generic. Anything that has anything to do with business, you clump in this bucket. Uh, but now that so many people are collecting so much different data sets, I can go from business to business, small business, to business, small business, home office content. Um, it gets incredibly granular. Um, and also, there's a lot more players that are selling data. If you're not paying for a service, you are the product and they're selling your data. And I'm buying that data and everyone's happy. Uh, so you can get incredibly granular, uh, but depending on the, the platform. So, um, and there's different types of data. It's gonna get really boring, guys. You can raise your hands if it's boring and I will skim through this. So you have probabilistic data and you have deterministic data. And what probabilistic data is, it's, it's almost like actual data, it's like login data. So if I logged into Facebook, that's, that's um, sorry, that's deterministic deterministic, meaning that I'm the same person logged into my uh, Facebook through my phone or through my desktop device, I'm the same person. When I say an age and I target by age on Facebook, chances are that's my actual age. Whereas if I target an ad on say, I don't know, houseathome.com or a different app, I've never had to log in and give my, my personal information. So in that case, it's, it's, deter it's uh, probabilistic. This person is probably this age and this person is probably interested in that. So it becomes an interesting, um, space, I think I said that 18 times. Uh, but yes, it gets incredibly granular. So for example, I'm doing a campaign for a big gas company, and they want to target fleet managers um, and municipal something or other. And we can actually target that, but only in like Hamilton. That's happening <laughs> across video. Yeah, so it's, it, yeah, it's, it gets really granular. I'm actually kind of curious, can you, are we at this point where you can sort of uniquely identify a specific customer of course, in terms of public policy, there's a lot of uh, issues around that and privacy and data issues, right. but across behavior, can you probabilistically figure out, based on someone's behavior on one particular device and then on another device, can you say, yeah, that's, that's Carol. Oh yeah, absolutely, uh, it's called cross-device targeting. Um, so 
when you use the walled garden, so Amazon, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, Google, so if I'm on Gmail and I'm logged in, and then I go on YouTube and I'm logged in, then yes, then that's absolutely, um, that's absolutely uh, a reality because it's the same user that's logged in and you follow them very accurately. But when you go everywhere else that you don't have these walled gardens and you've never had to log in, it's based on a whole bunch of different factors like how often did these two devices sync at the same time to the same Wi-Fi connection? Um, cookies and the recency of those cookies because cookies get deleted, device IDs, um, certain behavior patterns and browsing patterns. And when you stitch all these probabilistic pieces together, um, then you can determine, you know what, you have this, this uh, ID, this fingerprint of this person. And at no point do we collect personal identifiable information, because that's not legal. Um, but yes, you can stitch that together. And we run a lot of campaigns that way. So when we, because we run campaigns across multiple devices, multiple platforms, and to see how that user goes from point A to point B, and the 18 touch points that they had to before they like bought that pair of shoes, to see that graph becomes uh, an interesting story. And you have to stitch it together somehow. It's very interesting, very cool, and kind of scary. I'm glad you think so. Kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is. <laughs> but uh, I also know with millennials, they're very willing to give up their data, like their information. They don't have a problem with giving it. You'd think that they, because they don't trust people, that they would be kind of cautious about it, but for some reason they're... Uh, well, the Facebook well. login, right? <laughs> How many sites can you, like, in terms of single user login, Facebook? I want to sign up to like a new app that's not owned by Facebook, but you sign in using Facebook. It's just easy, and you're like, yep, I've done it 18 times today, that's cool, it's 19. That yeah, that, that I feel millennials are a lot more, um, I guess, first to it, so. But are they, are they conscious of the value of their data? I guess is the question. Well, they're getting something in exchange, right? Yeah, they they, like so they recognize it's like, it's a quid pro quo. Yeah. Yeah, I get this for free. Yeah, I know you can sell it to brands and whatever, but it's fine, it's worth it. Or are they not conscious of how data is, is being used? No, 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 they, they are very conscious. That's why they get ad blocks. Yes. Right. <laughs> also lazy, right? Because I'm like, if I was a millennial, I'm like, oh, 12 fields. You've got to fill that in manually. Or one button. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, you've got to play the constraints. Right. Yeah. So they're smart and lazy. <laughs> smart and lazy. That's the future. <laughs> uh, Work smarter, not harder. <laughs> uh, good point. Uh, Karen, this is a two-part question. Uh, so when going through the process of making content for a niche audience, what are some of the key questions you'll ask regardless of niche in order to make sure it's customized? I know that you focus on millennials in specific, but maybe there are some sub-niches within that. Uh, and the second part is when making content for an international audience, because I believe Carmela is quite international, what do you have to keep in mind as far as the consumer behaviors and legalities of showing content whose financing is tied to brands? I can repeat these again because these are long. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I, I think, I mean, Carmilla is a very niche audience, and uh, our belief is you go really delve into, like, I'd rather have 2,000 fans, like people that are very core uh, in a niche, and build out than start with a big mass. I mean, I always say mass is, in, in a way, it's to add a mass message. Um, but imagine uh, what we found with Carmilla was we connected in a really emotional way with the LGBT community. And what they found was um, that this was a story about, you know, a, a girl who's at university, um, and she falls in love with her roommate who happens to be a vampire. And there was no coming out story, there was no, it just, these women just were. And and it just went on, on fire because it, it created this community and they all started to share it and they started to talk and every time an episode came up they went there and they wanted to start to share their stories. Um, it was it, it did something that we were all kind of surprised. We'd sit in the office and we'd go, wow, oh, look at these this fan art coming in and these stories. Um, and, and I think from an international standpoint, you're right. I mean, we don't translate. Uh, you know, I know it's not, there's a French side here and we'd love to have French as part of it, but we don't have to. The fans did it. I think it's now in 15 different languages, and we never did any of that. I mean, we allow them the access to it, but they've come with Russian and uh, Turkish, and I mean, they, like they know, subtitled it or like yeah, their own overdubs. Or yeah, like no, 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 they subtitle it, yeah. so they they can create it. So you, if you go and watch it, you can just pick your your language of choice. Um, and so from the international standpoint, this this is a challenge for us, but I think an opportunity as Canadians. I mean, you'll notice with the RBC, um, our, is 
too. You see the RBC logo? Or the, the, the man, the man with the bowler hat? He's a white old dude with the bowler hat. And I went, oh. And so we made sure that our lead character was female and she's actually Southeast Asian. And they were really excited about that because that goes so counter for what they, you know, it's golf and it's TIFF and it's the Olympics and it's very, you know, again, these big, these big organizations. And we took something that was really different for them. Um, and that's, I think, in Canada, because we have access to more, you know, um, nationalities here in Toronto, for example, um, you can, you know, create content and find actors that will cover that kind of international scope. So I think there's a great opportunity for us here in Canada to provide content for the world um, and and give them an opportunity to see what, what other cultures are like. I mean, that's why Lily Singh is so popular. I mean, if anybody watched her, she has her superwoman. She imitates her, her mom and dad. And, and, you know, when they had the Southeast Asian kids, you know, growing up in Brampton, they were like, oh, this is exactly my experience. And so I think we do have a really great opportunity in Canada to create content that has that international kind of opportunity. Um, and we should be open to it. On the uh, boring uh, legality side, yeah. there, there, I suppose, is a sensitivity around branded content or content that is funded by brands and how that is displayed to audiences. So I, I'm actually not too familiar with how it works in Canada right now. Uh, but are you aware of anything else in the world? Like, I could see a, a nightmare of saying, well, these 17 countries require these sorts of uh, disclaimers, but these don't, and here you have to do that. I mean, is it in a very primitive state where no one's really talking about it on the video front? Or? Well, I mean, I, I know that in the US, um, the FTC is looking at making sure that influencers actually say, I'm getting paid to do this and put disclaimers on their, on their content. Um, so I think, you know, we're obviously all heading up in, in, from an international scope, I think. I, I wouldn't know how to answer that, I mean, but uh, it's certainly, I think more and more people are, are looking at how we're doing content and making sure that the, the audience knows that this is being funded and, and that type of thing, so. Right. Uh, also, quick question. You're talking about people doing subtitles, people drawing the arts for the boxes. How do you connect with these, let's call them brand ambassadors? Well, they're show ambassadors, but it also seems like it carries over to the brand, too. How do you identify, do you have like a one-to-one -one relationship with these people? Do you know who they are? And for example, does Kotex know who they are? Mm -hmm. And how does that transfer over as far as them being aware of that and, and knowing these individual people that are supporting yeah. them? Yeah, our biggest fan for Carmilla is in Scotland. And she will basically hop on a plane at a moment's notice and go anywhere that we're gonna be. So um, we, we do know the super fans, but what's really interesting now, we're going into season three is that the Americans have just discovered this thing that we've been running for them for two years, but they, they realize that this is a really hit show and they're now going, hey, we want to get involved and we'll actually support it with media. So we've never had um, media support before. And that's really hard now to kind of break through without having a paid campaign. Um, to, but it's back to that niche. I mean, you gotta find, there's all these people out there that don't see themselves reflected in any mass content. And so if, if you can bring them something that kind of speaks to them on an emotional level and reflects them, I think, you know, brands, you know, sometimes don't have the time to do that. And I think as storytellers that we can find those stories that aren't being told and allow brands to be part of that, if, as long as it reflects their values and who they are. Um, I think, you know, we've got wonderful opportunities. I mean, we're all looking for new ways to fund content, right, um, as, as storytellers. Um, I mean, you know, you, you, your show is fantastic. I watched it. It's fantastic. It's funny, and you know, it's great. And we've relied on the government for a lot of these funds, and at some point, that that could change. Um, well, that's the thing. If you don't fit exactly into the system in particular ways, then you can rely on the government for that. So you need alternatives. And turning to brands is a very, very logical choice, and it makes a lot of sense, in my humble opinion. Um, I'm actually curious. You're talking about underrepresented audiences. And niche audiences, and I think specifically in the case of Carmilla, the LGBTQ audience. Yeah. And I'm actually curious from a programmatic standpoint, you know, I'm just filling out the census form for Canada, oh, yeah. and you know, there's certain designations, but then, you know, somebody's chosen this, some committee's chosen this, not necessarily representative of everyone, as you can imagine. So I'm wondering if a community like the LGBTQ community, if in the programmatic modules, people have found a way to sort of model this data 
and, and, and have a way to target that community? Is, in your world, are people looking at different groups, different associations, and saying, okay, let's take the, this set of like seven publishers, and we're gonna say that's basically the publisher set for the LGBTQ community. We're gonna get that, that inventory and model these kinds of behaviors and bring that all together. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say yes, yes and no. So um, I personally haven't been involved in anything specifically targeted to uh, that community, but it's a possibility. And um, I've been involved in things targeted towards other niche communities, um, and there's definitely a need for it. Um, and in fact, there's a lot of studies done that um, the, the gay and lesbian community are very brand loyal. So if you get them, you have them um, in terms of retention. Um, Though there isn't like a data set that you can target based on sexual preference, um, there is other ways that you can kind of sideways target them, like for example, on social media based on their affinity um, or different associations they're part of. So if they, you know, if they're a fan of pride or um, you know other other relative associations and events and things like that, um, then you could target that way. Right. So it's if like a probabilistic model. Yes, yeah, so where you're you're kind of guessing that chances are that if this person likes these types of brands and associations, that they may fit this category, at least be an advocate um, or have friends in that in that category. Um, so I guess that and, and some things can be very sensitive if you target. So in that way, um, yes, but no. <laughs> uh, interesting. Yeah. Um, Caroline, let me follow up with another one for you. And actually, soon we're getting to uh, closer to the end of the session. So if there are, other, maybe I'll just ask one more question and maybe we can open this up to the audience. We have a microphone, the voice of God, or uh, whoever It's really bright, so I'm kind of looking, but you guys can look. Um, but uh, Caroline, I was gonna ask, one of the challenges of traditional advertising in the golden TV era was the lack of information you had about your audience for a show. What are the types of analytics now available for content creators and advertisers that want to know how content is being engaged in and streamed? I mean, Kyra was just mentioning before, I think it's a brain site it was, where literally there was something on people's heads, but typically that's not how most of us watch shows, although maybe we should. But for the regular desktop or tablet-based watching uh, audience, how granular can you get in terms of, I mean, I've seen eye-tracking studies and stuff like that. How, how deep can it go in terms of watching videos? Fair. So I think in short of Moving a third party that can do um, like like brain scanning or like heat mapping and things like that, it, it really boils down to the platform you're using to distribute your content and what kind of analytics they have. Um, and also, if you are housing it in two different places, like you have your own website as well as say YouTube, for example, um, to to kind of look at the different analytics that that will kind of record. Uh, so for video, if you're just surveying different videos, you can see by quartile, um, how deeply they engage before they dropped off. Depending on your analytics, you can see the demographic makeup of the people that are engaging. Um, I think YouTube also has a new feature through TrueView that you can retarget anyone that has subscribed to your channel or that has ever engaged with your videos and you can segment it in certain ways. So that becomes um, another powerful way to target and, and collect <coughs> information. So, I know it's not a great answer, but it really depends on the platform. So look at whatever you're using to distribute your content and see what they have under the dashboard and see what, how granular you can get. And uh, don't be afraid to uh, use other third-party uh, analytic systems on top. Um, and on that note, if you're using like Facebook, for example, to drive back to your content, like if you're using Facebook to drive back to YouTube or a site that you're hosting everything on, uh, make sure that you append certain tracking at the end of your URL so you can uh, look at the data in different ways. One actually last quick tangential data question related to what's going on in the lobby, yeah. and then we open up to the floor. What's so in the world of VR is that going to open up the data possibilities? Oh God, For I example, at, if I put on if I use Google Cardboard or I right. put something on like Oculus Rift and I move, you let, you know what I'm looking at. You know exactly what my eyeballs are looking at. Right. So, and to see like what catches your eye. Yeah, and I mean, so on one hand, it could be used, I don't know, possibly maliciously. In another way, it's very interesting to the creation of content to know where attention actually goes from the user. So I'm just curious, are there any discussions about what the analytics are gonna be around this stuff? Or people are just wrapping their heads around just making cool stuff? Yeah, I, I uh, so in Canada, I feel it's very early days. I think in places like Asia, where they, they kind of, I 
just grapple onto emerging platforms a lot quicker and they execute and they care a lot about analytics, so they need to make systems more robust. I haven't heard much about VR, but the, um, what was his name? The guy who just spoke on VR from Secret Secret Location. He was awesome, by the way. Um, I'm gonna sink in with him because I'm also a member of the Emerging Platforms Committee with the IMA, the Internet Advertising Bureau. I think now it's called the Interactive Advertising Bureau. Don't tell them I said that. Um, And I wanted to come present to the group. It's weird, advertising is a very self-regulated industry, so we have to push our own boundaries. Um, and like 90% of the people don't do anything, and then you have the 10% that, that do. And, and uh, so yeah, hopefully I'll have something different to report in a month with that guy's help. But um, for now, early days, I, I, I don't want to say anything wrong, so I don't know. <laughs> safe answer. Yeah, uh, long did say so. <laughs> so let's, yeah, let's open it up to the floor. Uh, hopefully there's some interesting questions from people from You guys look so back. excited. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, we have one uh, right up front here. Hi, this question is for Karin. Um, just, you touched on influencer marketing, but you didn't really delve deeply into it. Is it complementary to branded entertainment, or is it competition? And then also for my own personal edification, to get someone like Lily Sin to do something like that, it, does it cost a fortune? Like, is it pricey? Yeah, um, influencers um, are certainly um, a part of it. In fact, we get a lot of brands that say, hey, why don't you throw an influencer into your scripted series? But most of them can't act. You can't, once they get out of their bedroom and whatever they're doing, they just, they can't get it, they can't memorize lines. Um, uh, so it's, they're great to have to promote the show, but Lily's a perfect example, and actually Leslie's in the audience here, she had to deal with her manager on that. Um, yes, she's expensive. Um, yes, she decides who she's gonna work with. Uh, and if, if RBC had gone and said, hey, we want you to work with us, she would have said, no way. Uh, but because it was a show, and because she really liked the characters, she watched it, there was an authentic connection for her. Um, she, she agreed to, to talk about it, but uh, they were, it's difficult to deal with. I mean, she was flying to Mumbai, and you know, she's all over the world now. And, uh, um, but I think influencers play a really great role in uh, creating an authentic conversation with that fan base. And again, when we're talking about the LGBTQ community, you can actually find influencers that have a strong um, affinity within that group, and you can approach them and do, you know, work with them. And again, that attracts more and more of that audience. Um, and so uh, I know YouTube just opened up a little studio, actually just right down the street from our office, um, and they're trying to get more people to come in and, and use that space and, and kind of collaborate. Um, so. Uh, I think they are an important part of it, for sure. Got another one right here. Yeah. Hi there. I have a quick two-part question. One is, um, when you look at um, display advertising or all of the, um, the products in which you sell, uh, Karen, the question is directed at you. How do you tackle the ROI um, problem when you're talking to, if it's a problem, when you're talking to clients, what are they looking for? What type of... Uh, metrics are you looking at? How are you kind of uh, bringing that ROI? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's the same with traditional uh, campaigns. It's, uh, you know, I want to increase awareness and I want to sell more product. Um, so they always come generally with that. I mean, the bank is a little different. Um, but just awareness, we do traditional tracking. Um, we look at, you know, views, engagement scores, watch time. Uh, so we can, the wonderful thing about YouTube is we can do a lot of that tracking. Um, and we're now, we've grown, um, as we've learned that hey, this doesn't always work, we have to buy some. So now we're working uh, to make sure that we have a campaign so that if you want a million views, we just have to make sure we've got the, the, the budget set aside to get the views that you need. But at the end of the day, the views aren't what matters in my book, it's the engagement. So um, you're looking at different metrics like uh, time spent and CPM is something that's kind of totally out of the equation for you? Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, you know, again, dealing with the bank, we. We had, we had six marketers we were dealing with all the time, so we had to come back with analytics, and um, that's why we used um, outside third-party research companies to kind of analyze what are uh, the value, uh, how, what is the perception of the bank within this, this uh, cohort? Have we shifted perception? I mean, imagine if you could actually get somebody to go, hey, that, I didn't like RBC, and now they're kind of, hmm, they're kind of interesting. I'm at least gonna listen to what they have to say. 
Um, and that's really what we were trying to do with that particular campaign. Uh, we proved that we could do it. You're right, you have to do research before and really understand what their objectives are and have very measurable things that you're moving towards. But some stories, um, you know, it, it's harder for them to uh, see the brand archetype or brand values that we're trying to bring to the table. I mean, in that one, we talked about helping. They want to be seen as a bank that helps. And so the only way that V was going to come back to life, she had to help 100 people. And it was this helping and this emotional connection she created with the people she helped that we're trying to say without banging them over the head, like, we really do care about, you know, some of these issues that young people are facing. Um, and so that, that was really more of a, you know, not, the numbers didn't play a role in that. That was more of a gut check. Uh, but we also made sure we had, um, you know, electrodes in our heads. We sure <laughs> so there was a lot of combination of, you know, the creative process along with analytics. And I think the pivoting and testing, I mean, anybody who's creating content now um, on YouTube, it's, that's what the beautiful thing is. You create something, you can see within three days, did this work, did it not? How do I test it? Can I do differently? Hi, so I will segue to what you just said. I'm actually, we're here to talk about discoverability. Mm -hmm. And so, how did you get people to know that V Morgan existed? I mean, did you use traditional media to get to that? How did you, how was that put forth? That's one of my questions. And other, did you um, evaluate the, the rebound effect, if I could call it that? People thinking, oh, the RBC is cool because it's taking care of millennials. Or millennials, sorry. Uh, so I could, I'm not a millennial. Millennial, geez, that's not yeah. to say for a French person. Uh, but I could think that RBC is cool as well. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, it's all about finding that niche community we talked about. Um, and so, uh, V, the other thing that we had to show research and calm RBC down a bit was she's completely tattooed. So we went, we've got this East Asian lady and we want to completely tattoo her. And they were like, you could see in this board, we were like, mm, tattoos. And like, How do millennials feel about tattoos? Um, and we said they actually really like tattoos. I mean, Whole Foods is setting up a tattoo parlor in its store and it gave millennials. So tattoos are popular, but um, I think we went after communities and we started to engage the tattoo communities. We started to engage different communities of fans of different content that we thought. So in this case, Dead Like Me, and believe it or not, people still talk about that show. Um, they miss that content. So we can reach out to fan bases on Tumblr. And that's the first place we always go, is Tumblr, because Tumblr is great content for finding fan bases. And it's a lot of people just, you know, we have people in our office that are just searching for those stories and those fan bases. So that's what I would say. And certainly, we love anybody to watch the show. I mean, um, the more people that watch it, it's better. And um, certainly, we can we use that word millennial, but it's more um, mindset than it is. And if you're watching stuff on YouTube, we want you as well. So. This is a question for Karen. <coughs> um, you talked about um, trusting brands earlier and a lack of trust, or millennials trusting brands versus other people. When it comes to branded advertising, my my issue tends to be more about trusting the story rather than the brand that might be behind whatever the story is. And um, also in my conversations with creative friends of mine, and just like I said, my own personal reactions. If I find I find that a brand is behind a great story, <clears throat> I go, I feel like oh, I was fooled, or suddenly I will just drop the story altogether. Um, as being somehow irrelevant. I don't care about the brand. The brand mm. might be just fine. I might buy their product, but I don't want to watch the movie or the film or whatever it is anymore. And there's a lot of discussions in the, in the creative community about keeping, about that boundary between, you know, the, the advertising and the content. So what are some of your experiences with negotiating that boundary and, and dealing with um, that issue? Yeah, I mean, we use social media at the exact same time we're releasing content, um, and that's why we don't do it after one episode. It's feeling it out, it's creating that, that fandom um, before we start to bring in brand, and, um, you know, we've never had a negative, it's really interesting. 
we haven't really had a negative response to it. In fact, um, we've had the exact opposite. We've had really positive. Uh, because again, we're providing the content that they're not seeing anywhere else. So there's a sense of, hey, you get me and you're willing to give us all this stuff. I mean, our RBC was approached, the one girl, Mad um, Michelle, and other brands come up and call her brave. And I'm like, what a weird word to use to describe her. You're brave because she didn't put a logo and she didn't get involved in it, in the content. And so um, we, we haven't really had um, a negative from from uh, young people. Maybe you're, you know. <laughs> you let me know. No. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to know how you convince certain brands to wait 17 episodes before you show their logo. Well, that's why they're calling that's me brave. Amazing. That's why they're calling me brave. They say, my boss my got it all over me. Where's my logo? I want my logo. Yeah, I'm like, make my logo bigger. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, I was just curious how, um, how the relationships between the two of you would sort of evolve as capturing that audience and, and getting identifying the, those qualified leads almost from a sales perspective and then driving them into a long-term product like yours. If you could just um, elaborate a little bit more on how the two complement each other. Yeah, um, I think from a, from a paid perspective, um, we help, I guess we help kick off the process. So if it's good content, um, it, can, it can almost stand on its own. But just to light that fire to get some people going to it, then the organic growth happens. Um, I think in, in that sense, there's a lot of synergy. Um, there's also a lot of bad content that you need to drive. So um, when I used to work at MSN, we do these these big like content integrations for like L'Oreal, and it would cost you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we create this hub for them that we just all about fashion and maybe the Oscars or whatever. But we needed to drive eyeballs there so to keep L'Oreal happy and to try to get that growth, but if the content is not good, it's a very forced experience, so there's only so much paid can do. <laughs> um, at the very least, it'll keep the advertisers happy because they'll see the numbers go up, um, but everything else, I think, the heavy lifting definitely goes to the brand, or, or what you do. <laughs> but you're right, it's becoming more important. Um, I mean, our goal, our next goal now is we want to take a community, and this is that outbound marketing, and how can we create like an inbound marketing scenario, and really understanding how do we target them with, with, you know, season three is coming out. I mean, we've got, um, we're doing a pop-up store in New York on Saturday, and um, it's a period pop-up store, anybody's in New York. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> and it's sort of like, how do we get those people that we gave a sample to, that saw a cover lot, that bought a sample on Amazon, because we're now selling it on Amazon, and then drive them back to season three. I know a great way to do that in the video. Oh, but see, and that's why we need, If you, know, you upload your CRM database, you can, um, find these people back online because they've had to sign up. And then you can create lookalike audiences based on the common attributes of those people to expand that base. But yeah, they're very cool, very, very cool. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, and I also think one last point, like for Facebook, for example, there's a lot of um, platforms that used to be very organic, but the organic reach rate on Facebook now, I think is 2.6%. So if you say, put a message out to your community that are your fans, you're only gonna reach 2.6% of them. If you want to reach 100% of your fans that chose to be your fan, you have to pay to play. So it becomes a very interesting space. So yeah. it's 15% they dropped it? I think it's 2.6 or 2.7 as of Yeah, it's pretty very sad. Impressive. Pretty sad. Because you paid a lot to even get those fans, most brands anyways. Yeah. Like when I was at Samsung, we paid a lot of money to get the fans to where they are. And well, and that's always the fear, right? These true. social media sites can just yeah. change their algorithm yeah. and all your it's efforts crazy. have just disappeared. Well, only the angry people find you. The only people that would find SAS and organic are like, oh, my phone broke, and your fridge sucks. So, <laughs> where's my firmware? Um, all the happy people, you have to like put it in their face. They're like, oh, yeah, I like Samsung. Yeah, I do. So, uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, nothing's for free. I'm sorry you had to go through that. Um, so, you know, I love that we, um, I'm going to stop talking about it, but yeah, that was great. It was great. <laughs> uh, I think there's another question. It's almost five, so I guess maybe we can, after this question, we can do some closing discussion and uh, send people off. So the question is around um, programmatic buying. Sure, yeah. So it sounds like you buy display, video. Um, what about search? And how does search come into play there? And are you able to search beyond or purchase 
and just the search term and put more attributes around that term? Um, so in my particular company, uh, we do every channel but search, but we work with really closely with our search partner, uh, Reprise. Uh, that being said, we can, so there's a lot of cross-channel learnings. I use a lot of jargon words. Um, so for example, if Coca-Cola is running a search campaign as well as display, mobile, um, social, whatever, uh, we'll take their best performing keywords and we'll apply it across display. Because what we can do is we can do keyword scanning um, and we can base the targeting on uh, their recent behavior, which can include certain queries. So there is, it's the same audience, you just don't get them at the exact time that they're searching and they're putting in the query in the search bar. But you just get them a little later. Or you scan the page and you kind of, it kind of loops it together. In terms of um, the analytics, that definitely exists to tie everything together. Does that answer your question? Um, so maybe just to close up, I'm just thinking it might be interesting to some quick last thoughts if each of you might discuss for the remainder of 2016 going into 2017, what you think the most interesting trend is for us to look for in your particular field, and then maybe also what you are up to in your particular company that we should be looking out for. You can start with you, Karen. Well, I'm, I'm doing a show that I really want to get off the ground, one of the tech partners, by the way, um, about getting young girls to code learning about coding, and I think, you know, it's all that, that we can create a movement with getting really great content and across platforms, and again, um, pop culture doesn't show women in code is really an interesting job, um, and so we're, we're looking at, at uh, creating this big, you know, massive series of we'll have movies and digital series all around showing young women coding, so, I mean, the future, um, it's it's really testing and pivoting. Um, that's my, my big belief is, is that, you know, the content is very, you know, content is king, but data is, you know, is the queen of this, so you have to marry the two. Yeah, I'm not I sure like that's that. True. Steal that. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, I think it's a great series. I would, uh, I'm going to look out for it. I'd love to learn how to code. Um, in terms of the future for uh, paid advertising, it's definitely the collection and the refinement of data. Clean data in means clean data out. There's still a lot of garbage data. Um, analytics. And, and I think bridging everything together, because as automated as everything is, there's still some pieces that don't fit together because of standardization, right? So um, that's kind of the future, and hopefully that really cool VR stuff, I would really like to squeeze that. Yeah, we'll see how that video goes. Yeah, that's what she said. And then, hello. Uh, and then you said uh, there was a press release. Oh yes, yeah, so the press release, so look out for it. Well. As with Intuit, they're the, uh, <laughs> they're actually they're a great client, um, they do, uh, like uh, QuickBooks and TurboTax. Oh, really? Yeah, it's targeted towards um, just the like entrepreneur, tech savvy industry in Quebec. It's really, yeah, it's gonna be cool, so check that out. That's great. Yeah. Listen, thank you everyone. Uh, thank Jesse you. Jesse Jamal, uh, for being available.